if there's, I'm just saying to Carla backstage, if there's any positives from the pandemic, um, it has to be, one of them has to be the opportunity that we've been given to connect and host writers that pre-pandemic, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do so, um, mostly because of kind of geographical location. Um, Carla is based in New Haven in Connecticut and we are in Birmingham at the moment. Um, Carla, I've just said she's in um, New Haven, but her story didn't start there. It started in Ecuador. At the heart of Beyond Books are conversations, conversations that shine a light um, of new voices. And tonight we share the story of undocumented um, Americans. The Undocumented uh, Americans is a book about Carla, one of the first undocumented migrants, immigrants to graduate from Harvard. And it reveals um, the hidden lives of Carla's fellow undocumented Americans. It's a book about family. It's a book about duty, about love. And above all, it's about survival. If you've not read the book yet, I've got a copy here please do grab a copy and read it because it is such a kind of deep dive into some of the many stories and characters that Carla has kind of spoken to um, and it's about people kind of relaying their own um, journey as a undocumented um, migrant and we've got Dave Smart, um, beg your pardon, Dave Stamp from Assert which is an organisation here in Digba that um, in Birmingham even, in Digba, which deals with a lot of um, migrants and refugees who arrived to the city. So there are some similar parallels from what um, Dave was saying about some of the experiences that folk in Birmingham have with the stories um, in the undocumented migrants, Americans. The Undocumented um, Americans was a Barack Obama favourite book of 2020. It was also a New York Times best-selling book of 2020. I'm sure throughout tonight's conversation, we'll be finding out more about the book and why Carla wrote it. And Dave will be sharing some of the migrant experiences closer to home and the work that he does with Assert and how it connects with the migrant, documented or not, experience in the city. Before I um, hand over to um, Dave and Carla to share their videos. I just want to remind everyone on the call that you can grab a copy of um, the Undocumented Americans from This Is Book Club, who we've partnered up with, and we'll be sharing a link um, in the chat shortly. Um, Dave and Carla, I'm going to turn my video and audio off, and now it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Hi, Carla. Can you can you hear me? Okay, now. Yes. Hello. Great stuff. Uh, good, good to good to talk to you. Yeah, we, we had a we had a few glitches kind of backstage for, for people who don't know. So uh, hopefully, hopefully that those, those are, are are over and done with. Um, yeah, just just to introduce myself, really. Um, as as Nikki said, my name's Dave Stamp, um, and I'm a immigration caseworker, a charity called Assert Asylum Support and Immigration Resource Team, um, and we provide um, free legal representation to to undocumented migrants and, and to people at risk of, of becoming undocumented. So obviously, Carla, it, it was really interesting to read your, read your reflections um, and, and, and your, your experiences. And I guess one thing kind of that, 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 that strike, struck me um, in, in terms of, of kind of reading the book and, and also from Nikki's introduction of you, as, as I think she referred to you as the first undocumented migrant to, to um, graduate from Harvard, um, and I'm just kind of thinking of a lot of the, the young the young people that I find myself working with um, who are undocumented and we find ourselves having to um, negotiate ways to, to, to navigate past the citizenship for them um, to get them into particularly into higher education. I know in your 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 book you refer to, to kind of being undocumented when, when you were growing up as, as your dirty little secret. I wondered really if you could say a little bit about that. Um, thanks, Dave. I didn't refer to it as my dirty little secret. It was um, a publication in the States called The Daily Beast. When I was a senior at Harvard, I um, it was the way people talk oh, about my it. My apologies. It, it's okay, because I, I did um, I did write that. It was, it was published under my, not my name. It was, I published it. Um, it was published anonymously. Um, but it was, um, I... Um, I don't know if I went into it in the book, but um, it was the first piece that I wrote about immigration, about being an immigrant, and um, the way that they wanted me to um, sell it was to come out in this big, bombastic way and say, I have to tell you that I'm undocumented, and it's this dirty little secret that I have. And that hadn't been my experience, you know. It had. It was a different time. It was 2011, so 
than um, in the United States, um, coming out as undocumented was more of an ominous thing that required an announcement. It wasn't language that I felt comfortable with because I remember at the time saying, that makes it sound like sexual. It makes it sound like it's a vibrator. Um, but um, yeah, my experience with being undocumented um, as a child, as a young person was mostly administrative, was mostly bureaucratic. Um, it was had to do with financial aid. It had to do with college. It had to do with a driver's license, with ID. Um, it wasn't something that I felt had to do with my identity. That's something that I saw happen um, when I was a young adult. And I saw happen as an adult when people started really claiming undocumentedness as an identity. That's not an experience I had as a child. I see. Thank you. Um, that 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 kind of takes me a little bit to 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 the next thing that I, that I was reflecting on. Really, um, in the UK, particularly since two thousand and twelve, and I get you were talking about about kind of experiences, kind of pre two thousand and eleven. But but since two thousand and twelve, in the UK, there's there's been a deliberate um, administrative policy to create what's what's referred to as a hostile environment for for undocumented migrants to make life as difficult as possible um for for anyone who doesn't have the what what are considered to be the appropriate paperwork um which it, again kind of takes me back to it, it it wouldn't be possible for example for someone in the uk to graduate as undocumented because the the burdens particularly the financial burdens that were in the way, would just be um, far too great. And it seems to me that, that, that there, there is more of an emphasis in what, what's going on in the UK right now is, is a real kind of internalisation of, of the borders. So it's impossible kind of in every step of the way um, to, to live, or theoretically it's impossible to live your life as undocumented. So you can't rent anywhere. Or, or legally, you can't rent anywhere. You can't legally open a bank account. You, you mentioned um, getting a, a driver's license, but yeah, same thing would apply here. Um, healthcare is impossible to access, um, if, if or at least kind of yeah, secondary healthcare is impossible to access if you're undocumented. And it struck me that there, there was. I mean, I'm aware, for instance, that in, in places like San Francisco in the past, there have been administrations that have had kind of don't ask, don't tell. Um, uh, situations in place where where administrative organisations were not were deliberately not checking on on people's immigration status precisely because kind of wanting to, to to foster some kind of social cohesiveness and wanted to make sure that people could access the services that they needed um, and I guess the you know, the, the pandemic um, as as demonstrated the, the impact of, of of shutting people out the, we, we've had a thing in this this country of consistently shutting people out of services and then the pandemic hit and realizing actually that's that's exacerbating the public health crisis again i wonder kind of have i got that right it, it, is is it more possible perhaps to, to live your life in an undocumented way in, in the states that, that than, than it appears to be here in terms of you know can you open a bank account can you rent what, what kind of, of, of burdens are in your way in that sense um you know there's there's what's there's what is well it depends state by state um i'm from new york city and new york city is um a more hospitable place for immigrants than uh, some other places in America. There are places, um, I traveled around the country um, for the book and I went to uh, different states, different cities, but there were places that I didn't feel comfortable going to. I was on DACA, which is a, a two year program that um, undocumented young people um, grants them like a temporary status. Um, I was on that program when I wrote the book and I didn't feel comfortable going near the border region. I didn't feel comfortable going to various places. I also can't drive, um, not just because I grew up undocumented, but because I'm from New York City. And um, I went to places that you know, I would be able to use um, taxis or public transportation. So um, 
basically it de it depends on the location, but also there's like the legal stuff, there's the on the table stuff, and there's the under the table stuff, right? So in the book, what I do is um, I do take you behind the scenes of what it's like to be an undocumented person just living your life. Um, and people think of big crimes like crossing the border um, or, I don't know, um, I don't know what people think of um, to living an undocumented life. But you do, um, it's an underworld. It's an underworld, but underworlds aren't necessarily dark or shadowy or scary. There's a lot that you do to survive. Um, there's, you, there, it, it's, uh, it's really an art and it's a shared community art. You share your resources, you share your knowledge. When a person comes here and they're newly arrived, there are, um, there are businesses, local businesses, local restaurants, immigrants who have been here before um, that they tell you where you can get a job. They tell you where you can go to the doctor. They tell you where you can go to um, enroll your kid in school. They tell you what churches offer services for immigrants. It's a community-based knowledge. Um, Places like New York City have a lot of small organizations with people like you that offer those services. And especially before the internet, which is when my parents came to America, you really relied on members of your community. Um, as a writer, something that I don't do is obviously there are things that I know about how people survive, which are not dark, gruesome things. They're just basic realities of, of life. Um, how you get a fake ID, right? Um, that I don't write about. And that's something that I feel strongly about. And I think that's something that a writer who comes from the community or is invested in the community is something that they would prioritize. Something that I see in a lot of writing, and Dave, I don't know if you agree and you see this in the British press, but people who write about immigrants, sometimes for the sake of the story, for to get color, to get details, they'll sometimes report about illegal crossing, they'll report about small crimes that would implicate the immigrant and really mess up their legal case just to get a detail in. And I think if you're someone who's really conscious and sees them as a human being who has like an asylum case on the line, you understand that the most impactful thing about their case is not their illegal crossing across the border, but um, is really how they survive as a person. So, um, yeah, so it depends on the state, but it also I, I think the things that make a life possible and also worth living are the things that are compelling about being an immigrant. Thank you. Yeah, actually, one of the things that, that you, you you write about that I was really interested in was is you write about um, workers' centres and you kind of describe the kind of network of, of workers' centres and, and that kind of community organising um, model, I guess, that, that you you you've just touched on. I was really interested in, in that, that kind of uh, idea of worker center because it's a thing that we don't really have in the same way here. I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how, how they how they work and how people access that support. Sure, um, I went to, again, in New York City, there are um, different communities and there's one community called Staten Island, which is the most conservative, um, majority white, it is the only community neighborhood that voted for Donald Trump. Um, they're constantly trying to secede from New York City and join New Jersey. And you might not know this, but New Jersey is a state that's um, pretty, pretty looked down upon. Um, and especially New Yorkers don't like New Jersey. So the fact that Staten Island tries to join New Jersey, it's not great. Um, so um, I went to Staten Island and um, there are a lot of day laborers. So they're day workers. They're migrant men who do um, mostly construction work. And um, they had a bad reputation because they were reported on as idling on corners. And I thought that there was more to that because if I pictured myself standing on a corner in a hundred degree weather, waiting for a job and well negotiating my way into a job in a language that I don't I don't speak well competing with my friends for the job then being driven somewhere remote doing the job without a guarantee of pay 
that didn't seem like idling to me. That seemed like very complicated work. Um, and the way that you get more jobs is through networking. So I wrote a chapter where I sort of try to figure out this work. And what I discovered is that there were some, um, there was a network of worker centers on, across the United States um, where they, uh, they, it's an interesting model. It's um, run by immigrants, children of immigrants, um, and um, they kind of serve as intermediaries between people who need the labor from these migrant men and who sometimes, you know, end up negotiating with the men directly because they want to be abusive. They want to commit wage theft. They want to do all that kind of stuff. But if you want this labor from the men and you don't want to be abusive, you would go to the worker center and say, I'm looking for someone who's really good at tile work, or I'm looking for someone who's really good at plastering. And this is what I'm willing to pay. And they're kind of like agents, I guess. And um, they also provide like an indoor space for the migrants. Um, it also is like, you know, they have bathroom access. They have um, also they have know your rights trainings. So one thing that all of the guys I spoke to really blew their minds was that you don't sign something without reading it. And um, that's something I teach like young people that I come across with. Um, you know, contracts come up in, in our lives all the time. But some of these young guys, after they've done jobs, the employers would give them a paper and be like, this is just standard, just sign it. And they'd sign it. And it was like foregoing their their right to um, to get workers comp, or foregoing their right for, just foregoing their rights. And so they learned their rights. They learned how to do their jobs safely. Um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people when they think in the United States, um, when they think of how to support migrants, they think of like how they can personally free the kids in the cages with the aluminum blankets. And they don't realize that um, that those kids, if they're released to their family in the United States, the family's probably undocumented and that there are ways to support migrants um, migrant families that don't just apply to like the very sexy cause of kids in cages. And one of the ways of supporting them is through um, supporting worker centers. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I, I guess the flip side of, of, of that, and, and, and again, I think you, you've touched on it, is is the, the kind of exploitation and, and abuse um, that, that people are, I, I guess, vulnerable to. And you, and you speak of, um, Notorios, have I got that right? Who? Notorios. Uh -huh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, so people who, who are are basically exploiting people's people's needs for 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 regularization. Um, and it reminded I me. Mean, I, I'm just aware of, of of kind of in my working life. Well, for instance, we had a a woman who had uh, she she was. A single parent, she was working. She she managed to, to pay to save up and borrow a whole a whole lot of money. Um, it kind of it, it always bewildered me quite how she she, she managed to, to to get up as much money as, as she had to pay citizenship fees for her eldest child. Um, and she she was she came to me. She she described that she she paid this one particular guy to uh, make a citizenship application for her daughter. So in this country. Um, the citizenship applications that well, the home office charges you in excess of a thousand pounds, so quite a lot of money already. But then this guy that she'd been to see was charging her another thousand pounds on top of that for his fees. Um, and then she didn't seem to know what had happened. You know, I, I was saying, so so who was this person that you gave the money to? How long ago was it? She was describing it as kind of two years ago. She didn't really know. I said, okay, let, let me try and speak to him. Let me try and find out what it was. She just had his number, his mobile number written on a, a, a piece, a scrap of paper. And I was kind of going, so who is he? Who does he work for? What, you know, where, where is his office? And she's going, well, I've never been to his office. I've, I've just been to his flat and, and I paid him £2,000 in his flat. And, and, and what I've told you is what I know. And I'm kind of saying this, this, this sounds as though this sounds as though this guy, this guy is ripping you off. 
And she said, well, I did think it was quite strange because I, I thought it was a bit weird just watching his pants drying on the radiator. You know, this is the kind of situation that, that, that she was she was dealing with. And part of me is thinking, you know, white boy is thinking, well, but why would you do that? Why would you go and give this person £2,000 when you don't know who he is? But it was just someone who'd been recommended through the community and he seemed to have just disappeared off, off the face of the earth with his with his two thousand pounds and we had to try and work out a way of raising the money again to to, to sort out her, her her daughter's citizenship application but yeah that so that kind of exploitation seems to be systemic kind of here and and, and in the us but yeah I, I was wondering kind of what kind of practices that the notorios were were were, were engaged in is, is that a kind of familiar kind of pattern yeah just like that um you know, I don't, yeah, you bring up a good point, which is like, I didn't, don't want to romanticize, um, you know, the community-based knowledge too, because so much of it is, you know someone and you recommend someone. And a lot of it is notarios are people who pretend they're lawyers, mm -hmm. um, and immigration lawyers. And they tell you, they, they ask for money and they have all these certificates hanging on their wall, but they're not law degrees. And um, they take your money and run. Um, and, you know, a lot of undocumented, it varies. Some undocumented people are doctors, some undocumented people are engineers. A lot of undocumented people don't have formal education. And so when you promise them the sun and the moon and um, it, you know, it, you can you, you take advantage of them. Um, and, um, you know, what happens is we know you know, that in our society, when the government is absent, yeah. private sector takes advantage. Um, also, when the government is not just absent, but doesn't recognize you and doesn't recognize you as a legal entity or as a person, um, there is there there is plenty of room for criminals and individuals to take advantage of you because you're desperate to be recognized as a legal person entity and as a person. Mm. Um, and so that does happen a lot. I remember the case of one woman who I didn't include in the book, I don't think, but she came up to me at a party I was reporting at and she told me that a person um, in uh, Mexico had been extorting her because she told her, you know, that if she didn't pay her all this money, she was going to call ice on her. And I mean, that's a fairly straightforward extortion. You know, like anybody I, you know, knew about a domestic abuse situation where an abusive boyfriend was like, if you don't stay with me, I'm going to call ice on your dad. Right. Um, it puts you in a really vulnerable situation where if you don't have legal status, it's really hard to fight back with anything because yes. um, you're what... Um, what they have over you is, is um, they can take your entire life away mm. just for a phone call. Um, so, um, you know, there's, we think about the question of like, you know, additives, which is like, we can, you know, give them amnesty, we can give them legalization, we can give them a path to citizenship, but also at, with the absence of those opportunities, it's like people do live in terror um, at the mercy of, extortionists and abusive um, domestic abuse situations and, um, you know, criminals who just take advantage of them. And those mm. are basically your two options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ab absolutely. You, you talk actually when, when you're talking about um, people in particularly people in, in a kind of exploitative labor situations, you talk about the, the nature of the work that they're doing, you know, the, the sheer kind of grueling nature of the work that they're doing and the the, the absence of, of of regulation the absence of of, of decent protective um equipment and, and it, again it was very resonant of a a situation with, with, with a guy we're working with right now who's an eu migrant so he's actually not undocumented although he's at risk of becoming undocumented next literally next wednesday people from the european union who are resident um in the uk become undocumented on july the first if they haven't applied for settlement by, by that date but this guy had um 
he'd been obviously working in in some kind of really unsafe factory environment he's presently in hospital with flash burns over his entire body to the extent that he can't even sign he literally can't sign a piece of paper authorizing us to do work um and it's entirely known where he was working um because the police have taken documentation to to hospital and yet no state authority seems remotely interested in 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 pursuing that um which again seemed seemed a familiar scenario for, from from some of the, the the yeah some of the stories you, you've written about. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it it happens a lot with people who work in in um, you know in in um, areas sectors that really abuse the body um, in manual labor um, that just really destroy the body, and um, they obviously don't have. You know, even if they've given their entire life to that work and they somehow managed to not get um, fatally injured or injured in a way that destroys their lives, and they make it to old age. Like they can't, they don't have the support of the state in old age the way that citizens do, even the way poor citizens do. Um, and so, yeah, that happens a lot. Um, that happens a lot. Yeah, yeah. Horrific. Again, on, on, on the, I guess on, on the, on the idea of work, you talk about, um, you, you mentioned kind of people helping out with kind of um, after, after 911. And there's kind of interesting dynamics there of, of, of people initially being kind of greeted as, as heroes for, for kind of helping out with, with the 9-11 um, relief effort. And then that, that gradually, you, you, you describe a, a, a situation where people start shouting, go home at them. Um, as they're doing work, and I'm, I'm kind of one of the things it was reminding me of was um, during the, the the pandemic over the, the past uh, 15 months or whatever. There have been loads of kind of good news stories about refugees and migrants who have been kind of providing community relief, kind of free of free of care. That they've been kind of organising community support and kind of you know the, these are the good ones. And it also reminded me of, of that guy, uh, Mamadou Gassama. I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with him, but he was a, a an undocumented guy in France who um, who basically climbed a building like Spider-Man to rescue a baby um, who was hanging from a balcony. And for doing that, got given citizenship. And this idea of, of, of the... Yeah, just, just the, the, the kind of levels that people have to, to go to to, to actually be recognized as, as 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 worthy of value and again it was it was kind of reminded me a lot of of, of, of the situations you you were talking about where, where the ways that people are, are, are undervalued and 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 yeah i guess the the idea of, of of the the acceptable migrant being the superhero yeah um i've thought about that the case with that guy in france a lot mm -hmm. um because um you know those stories make it over, the stories seem to happen in Europe a lot, <laughs> and they make it overseas. And I've always thought the story since about that story since I was a kid because I've, you know, at night when I'm before I, you know, I toss and turn before I go to sleep. I like sometimes fantasize about. I used to fantasize about those things happening to me, and usually because there's so many mass shootings in America, wow. um, carried out by white men, um, American men. I've always been like if I stopped a mass shooting, I could get my citizenship. And I would just fantasize. I wrote a piece about it um, that um, a friend of mine, the great Eileen Miles, um, nominated me to write for a publication that they um, had written for. And I wrote a piece in which I fantasize this grotesque, uh, imagine this grotesque scenario in which I um, stop a, um, a hostage situation at a bank and um, all of these uh, blonde women, um, like uh, like you know, moms in a in a Hummer, um, thank me for it, and it's how I you know I get my citizenship. Um, yeah, it's um, it it happens rarely, but it's 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 um, projected across the world so much that you understand that um, that you do have to be such a statistical anomaly. And I mean, I'm that statistical anomaly too. And um, 
um, I'm, I understand that I'm a palatable immigrant in some ways um, because of the institutions with which I'm affiliated, Harvard, Yale, mm. the, my publisher, the New York Times, the New Yorker, all those things. And so, um, and so I, I'm accepted um, and yeah. I'm allowed to talk. Um, and um, I also, um, when people hear me talk, I can, you know, be crass and I say things that are a little bratty. And then th those don't, those don't jive, right? Because I have, you know, I've, I've grabbed the American dream in my hands, but I'm also saying that the American dream is a pyramid scheme and that I don't believe I'm, I, I'm not grateful to anybody, not to this country, not to my parents. Um, I believe that a lot of it has to do with luck and with like genetic happenstance. And that makes people really angry. There's a lot that we demand from immigrants, not just heroism, but a performance of, of affect, of gratitude, of patriotism, of subservience. So I've experimented with that. I've seen the, the way that people react to me. First is that they wanna be inspired by my story, um, but I don't give them much of that. And then when they um, mm. get some of my personality, they there's a lot of anger. Um, when I've looked up my, um, you know, reviews of, not reviews of my book, but um, you know, on Amazon stuff, uh, people commenting on my book, most of it is not um, anything to do with my book, but people don't like it how often I swear and they don't like how um, how ungrateful I seem. Um, so I, think I did like that to be fair. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, so it, I think immigrants have to act a very particular way to be, um, to be, even if you assimilate, even if you assimilate, which I have, um, you you still have to perform a certain mm -hmm. kind of subservience to be to be palatable. It's it's interesting because I, that, that there was there was a very much you talking about the, the 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 Harvard graduate thing, and you talk about if I remember rightly, you're talking about a, a, a group of, of, of migrant, or, or you're going to to talk to a group of, of migrant women, um, and you're described there. As a Harvard graduate, and 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 you're 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 feeling a little bit uncomfortable with it. You kind of, I think you say something like, "Well, I, I see myself as 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 a, a, an escapee from a cult." I think is 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 the is the term you use. But but I know that it's it's more it's 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 more palatable for them. Again, very much that that successful story. Oh, look, here's one of us that that, that made it good. Have, have I got that right? Well, the cult thing was was about my religious upbringing, which yeah. is going to be my um, the book after the novel. But um, you know, I the, the Harvard thing is interesting because it is the it is the it is the um, it is my number one identifier when people talk about me. Mm. I didn't write about it in the book. I didn't write about Harvard the book. Um, mm. It was it. There's nothing much to say. Um, it was it was college, and I don't remember a lot of it um, because I was quite depressed. And um, you know, it I don't really remember. My most of my memories involve the dining hall, frankly. So um, you know, the thing is, um, in order to market me, in order to market me, people really like to use that, mm. and. Um, and that also was really difficult because I think my book is quite good and it's done really well critically um, as a literary work. Um, and also I'm an artist. I like, I'm not like a, this is not like my sad story about growing up in, in, in the hood or anything, but um, because the marketing has been that, you know, you know, one of the first undocumented immigrants from to graduate from Harvard tells the story that has been it has been an uphill battle to try to convince people that I'm a real writer and that I can write and that um, and that I'm not going to talk about Harvard. So um, yeah, also you know when I do events, um, sometimes I get asked for like immigration legal advice um, and. Often it turns into therapy sessions, which is um, I think about this all the time. As an mm. immigrant writer, it's um, the the canon in America is emerging, um, in um, 
in you know in in England and France, it's a it's there's a there's a different tradition. There's a greater tradition, but in America, the 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 immigrant literary canon is um, with um, where where the immigrant artists are able to have a bit more freedom creatively. Um, that's emerging, um, and one of the roadblocks to it is if you are if you have the platform, if you have the access, you're probably very well educated. And then all people want is from you is for you to be a model immigrant, for you to be an inspiration. Mm. And it's hard to move beyond that. Hmm. Yeah, sure. No, uh, yeah, I, I, I completely hear that. Uh, I, again, I mean, uh, just thinking, you, you talk about the, in the chapter where you're, you're talking about Flint, and there's a very powerful thing you, you, you say, where you just basically say, you're talking about the appalling conditions that people are living through in Flint, and basically just say, they want us dead. You know, they, it, it, it's that stark. And I was reminded, I, I don't know if, if you're familiar with, with uh, the, the Grenfell um, tragedy um, in this country, but, but the Gren Grenfell Tower was, was basically a block of flats um, which had kind of criminally dangerous cladding around it um, and which burned down four years ago. Um, the residents had been saying for years, this place is dangerous. There were no sprinkler system in place. Um, there was no... Yeah, there, there, were not, there wasn't adequate fire doors. There was nothing. And the place burned down. 72 people died. Um, and there, there's still been no no justice as as a consequence of that. Most of the residents of, of Grenfell were, were, were migrants. Many of them were um, undocumented. And I was reminded, actually, um, because there, there was this idea of an amnesty for, for the undocumented, um, and again, when you're talking about the 9-11 the, the relief effort, you talk about kind of, uh, there's a passage which talks about making sure that, that no undocumented migrant um, who was involved, uh, or, or that undocumented status is not used, is not weaponized against people who, who were um, caught up in, in the 9-11 tragedy. But then bureaucracy always finding a way to kind of get around that to actually make sure that that's not accessible to people um again have, have i got that right how, how exactly did that work yeah um the um the group of people that worked in 9 11 who i met um who were scarred pretty badly by it um in terms of injuries health conditions and psychologically um their intent was that 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 they get green cards from from you know from it um and at least um they, they not be deported right um yeah. and um that seemed fair to me um although that does bring us back to um you know this question of if you experience great trauma um if you experience great trauma there's something really grotesque about that. Of course, I believe that they should not be deported because they were heroes. Like, um, obviously they were heroes, just like the firemen were heroes and the EMT workers were heroes. They were first responders, they were second responders. Um, but then just more broadly, the question of um, rewarding with citizenship um, the great traumas of um, migrants, where the design in the in the country is to exploit them, the design is to cause great trauma, because yeah. after every natural disaster, after every national <laughs> tragedy, um, undocumented people are you know um, tapped in that their <laughs> the undocumented network is tapped into to get workers to do cheap labor in really dangerous circumstances. Um, so the, it doesn't work for the model to be like, you know, uh, and then we reward them with citizenship. The, the state is not gonna do that. Um, so, um, and if, I mean, if they did, it would be, it would be grotesque. It would be a hunger games, right? You know, mm. volunteers who do this and risk their lives and, you know, uh, get really sick and get cancers, they'll be rewarded with citizenship. It would be the Hunger Games um, because it's not like an accident that this happened. 
it's happened after Hurricane Katrina. It happened after, mm-hmm. you know, it happens. It happens. We know it happens. It's predictable. So, you know, those are my thoughts on it. And like you mentioned, um, um, the, the the government knew that the towers were unsafe, but they didn't do anything about it because mm-hmm because they knew who was living there. Uh-huh. You know, similarly with the pandemic here in the United States and um, the people who were dying in the greatest numbers were African-Americans and Latino people. And so it didn't surprise me when there was a massive backlash to wearing masks um, by white Republicans because the people who were dying in mass were not, um, people who looked like them. Mm. Yeah. In in this country, there, there, there was a woman, uh, Belly Majinga, um, who was a she was a worker on the um, on the on the on the underground on on the tube system, the uh, the subway, um, mm. and a yeah, uh, she, she was an African migrant, and a a white guy spat in her face, um, and she contracted COVID, and she died, and no one has been charged with with that um yeah it's absolutely the same the same uh, my mom um, my mom who is undocumented and clearly you know looks um latina looks partly indigenous you know she was walking in brooklyn and uh, <laughs> a white man um went up to her took off his mask and coughed in her face and wow. um obviously i hate him but there's, there was nothing to be done. She just told me and I cried and, um, but not on the phone with her. Um, you know, it happens, there, there became a new, um, a new way to be able to injure people. Um, and it doesn't just happen to people of color. It, um, it, it um, you know, it, it happens, there, it just, the pandemic al- allowed there for be a new way for you to just use your body um, without even using your hands to just use your, your presence and your proximity to people to um, to try to murder them. <laughs> um, and you see you see um, that by people who refuse to wear masks, who refuse to to um, move away from you, who refuse to, you know, um, it's very easy to um, to become very powerful by just mm-hmm. um, inhabiting your body. And uh, a lot of people are walking around using that power very quietly, and it's very chilling to see. Mm, yeah, I, I read um, just yesterday, in fact, the uh, the the infection rate in in Cornwall following the G seven um, has gone up two and a half thousand percent um, following that that uh, event, and it's mainly among young hospitality workers. Yeah, just absolutely those those are the people who who are kind of exposed to this so yeah absolutely that that thing of disregard um for for the well-being of of people that you you view to be your your subordinates or whatever yeah absolutely um i wanted to ask something too you 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 say something really interesting You, you talk about the, the, the process of aging um, as undocumented, and you talk very, very kind of powerfully uh, about, but I, I guess particularly the, the, you, you talk, I think particularly of of men kind of using using their, their bodies and, and their physical strength, and what happens um, when that, that 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 physical strength starts to move, and there being no kind of retirement plan um, for for the undocumented, and I, I was reminded, I mean here. Um, in, in, in the UK, that there, there is a there is a pathway for for adults who have been in the UK for who, who have been in the UK undocumented um, for a particular period of time, and it used to be ten years, and it went up to twelve years, and now it's twenty years. Literally, you have to spend twenty years of of, of your life undocumented before you can before there's a pathway to, to regularisation open for you, and that costs thousands of pounds and it takes a dec another decade to get to it but it does exist i wonder does does anything like that exist um in the states really wow yeah my parents have been in this country for 33 years wow yeah. uh, okay 
that's incredible. But I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, no, it's uh, it's really funny. My parents have um, um, <laughs> they've been in this country for longer than they've been they were in their home countries. Um, sure, they left sure. their home countries when they were in their early twenties. Um, so um, you know, it's it's um, just definitely something to think about. Um, how do you become documented in the States? You can't, um, you can, um, you can get married to an American citizen, but that is, um, you, I mean, it's, um, I got married to my partner, um, mm -hmm. five years ago. Um, and that was extremely expensive. Um, and, um, it required extensive, extensive, extensive documentation, letters, text messages, printouts of emails going back years, um, uh, you know, um, things, you know, communications between our friends, um, pictures of um, not just us, but with friends, with family, um, just, just extensive documentation that if you have a real relationship, you wouldn't even think to have because you're not trying to prove your relationship to, to a government, right? Um, and also then there is an interview, um, w which this was under the Trump administration. During the interview, if they, if you, if you don't pass, you could get deported right mm -hmm. then. Um, and so the prospect of it was we went in <laughs> And like we were, we were, we were a real relationship. But if for some reason we got an officer that wasn't very nice, that wasn't very friendly, and who didn't like us, and also we're a same-sex couple, so mm -hmm. that that didn't help, you know. Mm -hmm. um, he could he could just say this doesn't seem right, and I would be deported, and there would be nothing to be done. Wow. Um, so the stakes are are like that bad. Before there used to be um, children who, when American citizen children, when they turned 21, could petition their parents. Okay. Um, nobody else, not their siblings, not anybody else, just wow. their parents. And then again, during the Trump administration, um, children who petitioned their parents, I had a, a you know someone that I someone that I know when she petitioned her father, her the immigration officer took her father away and then put him in detention and then he was deported. I mean, for no reason. He did not have a deportation order, just, just arbitrary cruelty. While this was her legal constitutional right, he was just taken from her and deported. And um, it became so badly, so bad that, um, that children were advised to not petition their parents anymore because their parents were just going to be deported. So there isn't, I mean, so there, there I guess the only way is a uh, marriage, but you know, you're, you're still taking a risk. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the picture you're painting of, of, of the, the hostility um, towards um, people, People try trying to, to regularize. Well, no, actually, not people trying to regularize status with being married. People who are not documented trying to marry um, is 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 really familiar. And in this country, there there have been literally um, people have been arrested um, at the kind of during their during their wedding ceremonies. People have been kind of apprehended by by immigration advisors and, and detained literally during their their, their wedding ceremonies. It's it's. It's, it's horrific. Um, okay, I'm, I'm conscious at a time. It, it's been a pleasure, Carla. It's been really interesting. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing your time with us. Um, Thank you, Dave. It was really nice to know more about um, how <laughs> how similarly fucked up the UK is. But, absolutely. Um, thank absolutely. you so much for doing the work you do. Um, yeah. Artists can't do the work we do without organizers and people on the ground um, doing this hard work. So thank you. That's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nikki, are, are, are you there? 
I am. Thank you. I was just uh, dropping you a message backstage saying we do have time. So if you've got questions, or you can carry on the conversation. But if you feel you've come to a natural pause and end, um, I know one that's kind of that chatty in the uh, the stage chat. So we haven't had many questions. But um, can I take this opportunity to kind of thank you both? And it's interesting, Dave, as you were saying here in the chat, that there's definitely parallels between what Carla, um, Carla has experienced herself in the communities and some of the individuals she's connected with and some of the people that you're working with here locally in the city. I'm, I'm really horrified, Bo, but at least in, in the UK, admittedly, this is a piece of EU law and kind of what will happen when, when, when that's completely out of, out of the window, I don't know. But at least in this country, uh, an, un an undocumented mother, for example, who is mother to a, a, a British child, gets a right of residence from that um from what from what you're describing carla there is nothing like that um and that's that's horrifying yeah um it is um it is <laughs> yeah um but you know we are um we are still hopeful and we uh, definitely are not a uh, people that um loses hope um mm. for better or worse we are not a people that loses hope. <laughs> well, without hope, what are we? Definitely. Yeah, Dennis just right. made a point in the chat saying the points around ageing while being undocumented are really interesting. And, and that, you know, I, I, as Dave was saying, I was quite horrified when you just, you know, you should just share that your parents have been in the States for over three decades. They've spent longer in the States than they have in, you know, they, they're in Ecuador. Is that where your parents are from? Correct yes. me wrong. Um, and, you know, to think that folk have to jump through so many hoops and they still don't get residency. We've just recently gone through a period here in the UK where we've had, like, the Windrush generation. You know, yeah. I'm, you know, a product of a first-generation, you know, migrants. My parents originated from Pakistan and my dad came over. Um, there's lots of colonial kind of legacy. Um, when they post-war and they needed cheap labour, and, you know, I'm horrified to think that my mum, my dad's passed away now, but... You know, as some, my mum does have a British passport, but there is, you know, a possibility because there's so many cases that we've read about in the UK where parents have got British passports, but yet they've been deported. And, you know, there's cases of like um, some twins where they've never been to their parents' country of origin, country of birth, sorry. Um, you know, the twins have been separated. I think they're like 10 or 11. I can't remember. They're fairly young, Dave. You might know the details of this case so it sounds as though both our governments have no empathy <laughs> when it comes to migrants but when there is a need for cheap labor then it's like you know we, we open the doors to to a degree so um yeah. another perfect example though i mean i mean that there is the whole wind rush compensation uh scheme which has theoretically been set up but but no one has had any significant um compensation from that at all and lives have been absolutely devastated as you say yeah people have lost the people have died and they've mm. not had any compensation yeah. so they put a claim in you know and then you know we've had this whole the incompetency of our governments in terms of losing essential paperwork and you know you know Carla you just shared how when before you and your partner got married you had to put, produce all this documentation to kind of to kind of show that you've got this evidence that you know you're in a legitimate a real relationship it's not a bogus phony one just for the sake of a green card and it's but, so yeah, intrusive it's so intrusive where they lose essential paperwork and there's no combat there's no accountability so um yeah i mean if folks haven't got a copy of um the undocumented americans i do highly recommend you getting a copy and reading it um to kind of appreciate some of the you know the stories the journeys the lived experiences that the folk that you've, you've spoken to for the book um you, you know it's, it's just such a highly recommended read and i can see why it's been shortlisted for so many awards and you know i met you you said something carla about um as immigrants, there's a lot that's expected from us. And one of the things we do with Beyond Books, and it's, I find um, it's an area of work that I lead on um, for my organization. And for me, I'm really passionate about people having the opportunity to share those authentic voices, those narratives that often miss from the mainstream. And and, and I think, you know, we, we have empathy, we learn empathy, or we gain empathy from people's lived experiences. And we've got another Beyond Books event this Saturday, and it's called Cut um, From The Same Cloth. And it's a book about, 
um, 21 essays from uh, visible Muslim women. And as someone who wears a headscarf, who's visibly Muslim in the UK, there's a lot of narrative in the mainstream media about, oh, I must be oppressed because I wear a headscarf, or you know, I don't have agency to you know go about my business. And it's because that's the the narrative the mainstream media want to portray. And it's a little, you know, it's a bit about the the negative portrayal of um, migrants both sides of the pond, you know, be it in the States or, or in the UK. And I think it's conversations like this. It's like people who write books who, who share their experiences that enable us to say, actually, what you're reading in mainstream press is not the true, the true story. And it's like hosting these conversations. So this book event that we've got on Saturday, you know, we've got the editor of the book and three other contributors sharing, you know, yes, we might be Muslim women, but that, you know, we are not a monolith. And what you're reading in mainstream media is not what it's all about. So, um, and then we've got another event um, next Monday, in fact, with two long-term thinkers, um, a guy called Roman Krasnarik, who wrote The Good Ancestor, and um, Iceland's um, Andre Magnusson, who's written a book called On Time and Water. I feel as though hosting book events, it kind of gives us a way to kind of, in an unformal way, inform ourselves and educate ourselves about things that matter to us as as a species, as a culture, as a community, and you know, having a long term, having these long term thinkers host this event next Monday, it makes us think about, you know, what are we leaving for future generations? And if your parents have spent 30 plus years in America and they're not documented yet, you know, they're not officially Americans, you know, do they call themselves Americans? So we, we need to think about what legacies are we leaving for generations to come? And let's hope, you know, things improve on both sides of the pond in terms of welcoming. And, you know, migrants are making, you know, be the UK or be, you know, the United States of America, that people do feel that's their home, you know, and learning from your experience and, and the experiences of the many people that you've spoken to, just, have, you know, for us to have that bit more of an empathetic mind and welcoming people. And, you know, as Dave, you will know this with a lot of people that you've connected with, with the work that yourself and Assert are doing in the city. So, um, yes. Apologies for waffling, but thank you both for giving up your time this evening. Um, Carla, thank you. Dave, thank you so much. And for those of you who are watching, if you've got any last minute questions, um, you know, pop them in the chat very quickly. Otherwise, we'll be shortly finishing. And um, thank you. I do want to say um, that um, I do want my parents to be welcome, but I don't want them to have a platform. They uh, should not have a platform. Um, they are, <laughs> sometimes I write pieces that are fact checked and my parents get to be on the phone with fact checkers for hours at a time. And they definitely uh, want to, you know, if they had access to the Daily Mail, they would sell me out in a second. So <laughs> don't get, you know, ask. I'm for migrant rights, but I'm not for all migrants having a platform, especially if those migrants are my parents. So, you know, I do draw some lines. No, no, I agree with you, and I, I hope. I mean, I don't know what your equivalent. We call it. I call it the daily fail. I don't know what the equivalent of the daily <laughs> fail in the states is, but we definitely don't want to be platforming <laughs> that or, or that a publication. So, no, I, I appreciate what you're saying. So, um, so Carla and Dave, thank you so much, and for folks who are watching. Okay, thank please you. Copy of okay. the. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you.